Thank you very much, uh, Joaquin and Hans, for this uh, uh, very insightful introduction to Edmond Becquerel's legacy in photovoltaics. And we are now uh, uh, going to another session dedicated to rec recent developments in photovoltaics. And the chairman will be Joachim Luther again and Nathanael Schneider from IPVF. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. who will start? <laughs> you, you. So, yeah, or ladies first, Nathanael Schneider, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I shall switch to, to French. I'm, I'm not sure what, what's best, but just for the moment. So uh, actually, uh, so for this session, we will be like two share people. So myself, Nathaniel Schneider, I'm a chargé de recherche, a researcher at IPVF indeed. And uh, yourself, you are him. So I'll let you introduce for our first speaker who is uh, Andrew Snakes. Okay, uh, thank you, Natalie. Uh, I will introduce Henry Snace. Um, Henry received his PhD from Cambridge University and after several research positions, amongst this two years at the EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, he became professor of physics at Oxford University Dr. Snace has pioneered the development organic, of organic, inorganic hybrid materials, in particular for applications in photovoltaics, that is perovskite solar cells and silicon perovskite tandem cells, the topic of his talk. He is co-founder and chief scientific officer of the company Oxford Photovoltaics, named the perovskite company. So uh, Henry, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Joachim. Um, and uh, bonjour tout le monde. Je vais continuer en français parce que, no, je rigole. I'm gonna give my presentation in English, otherwise it would be disastrous. <laughs> but, but welcome everyone. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, present at this um, at this symposium, at this, this meeting. Um, now, sorry, just a technical thing, share screen. I've just got to find the right button. There we go. Um, so I will um, talk about uh, the advent of perovskite solar cells. Um, so in, in the sort of um, theme of sort of the historical relevance of photovoltaics, um, firstly, we're just going to consider what a PV cell is and then look at the different options for photovoltaics. So this, this is an audience that knows about solar cells, um, so I don't need to go into the, the details, but as you know, a photovoltaic cell comprises a semiconductor sandwiched between charged selective contacts. And this semiconductor could be a whole range of materials. Um, and as, as Joachim just said, that silicon really is the dominant material at present. But in essence, when we class, for, when we class photovoltaics into different technologies, we're really referring to what is the main active component, the main solar absorber material. And in fact, all the- Henry, you're not showing your screen. You're oh. not showing your screen. Okay, sorry, let me just- I think it would help. That would help. Um, <laughs> right, screen two. I should be sharing screen two. Maybe I'll just try to share. All right, let's try this one. Share. Okay, I've just got to, that's it. Right. Can you see, you can see my PowerPoint now, I think. Yeah, yes. I'm yes. just going to go Good. into to full screen mode. And yeah, can you see the full screen perfect. mode? Or, yeah, yeah, perfect. 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 Okay, so the the actual charge selective materials, contacts, and um, charge extraction layers can be common for many photovoltaic technologies, but the, the real core ingredient is what is the solar absorber material and what are we using? So with respect to that, um, as, as you, you all are aware, selenium was one of the first materials used as a solar absorber in the eight, nine, 1880s and 1870s. And um, move, moving on from that, actually, the chalcogenides, cadmium selenide, 
um, has been investigated quite a lot and from the 1930s and of course now we're aware of the, the CADTEL um, production from First Solar which is still a significant fraction though much less than the majority of the global production capacity. And of course silicon, the, the material um, most of you love and I've grown to love, which is something that's been around since the 1950s in the form of a photovoltaic cell. And of course it's dominating the growth in the industry. Um, gallium arsenide, the 3-5 semiconductor materials first really demonstrated in the 1970s, um, show re very high efficiencies, much higher efficiencies than silicon. But of course they require very high purity and very low cr crystal defect densities which means the methodologies for produ producing gallium arsenide are typically molecular beam epitaxial growth that um, is very expensive. So they haven't competed for flat plate technologies, although they do compete on efficiency. So that brings us to other materials. We have a whole periodic table here. And of course, we can't just randomly mix things together and think they're going to make semiconductors. But of course, the metal halides have been known for their photoactive properties for a long time. and um, this certainly led researchers to look at metal halide compounds to see if they could be of use in, in optoelectronic um, devices and specifically in photovoltaics. So as far as perovskites come, which, are, which silver, silver halide is not a perovskite structure, but the materials, the, the metal halides that have proven effective in photovoltaics are perovskite structure. A perovskite material takes this ABX3 crystal structure where it's composed of three ions. Most, a large part of the bonding is ionic, so it's more like um, a salt a crystal rather than a covalently bound um, crystalline semiconductor like silicon. Um, and the, material, the, the materials that have sort of proven useful in photovoltaics are based on these lead halide compounds. So again, these aren't new materials per se, they were first discovered in 1892 or first reported in 1892, the cesium lead halides. Now, it was quite a while until they were first introduced into solar cells. And um, Tom Miyasaka and his colleagues in Tuan University used um, methyl ammonium lead triiodide and tribromide, um, to a few perovskite compounds, in what were at the time disensitized solar cells and, sh and showed functional photovoltaics. So if we look at the semiconducting metal halide perovskites, they're all based on these group four elements, germanium, tin, and lead. And there's quite a bit of work done in the 80s and 90s looking at them as potential semiconductors. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, the material which makes quite a good solar absorber material is cesium lead triiodide, but actually a, a, a the, the, to, to form the stable perovskite crystal, you have to have the right ionic radii of these at ions to fit together. And cesium is actually a little bit too small. Um, so this material, although it makes a good solar absorber material, it's not phase stable at room temperature. So it undergoes a phase transformation into a non-perovskite phase. And actually we, we would like to use francium. Francium would make a fantastic um, singly charged A site ion, but of course it's radioactive, so we can't do that. But in fact, there are now synthetic compounds, and this methyl ammonium lead triiodide was first reported in 1978, so again, not a new material. Um, and that led to quite good photovoltaic devices. So this was, this was really our starting point in working on um, perovskite solar cells. I collaborated with Tom Miyasaka and specifically Takuru Murakami in, in Japan and sent a student, Mike Lee, over to try to learn about these perovskite materials on, on a, a collaborative project. And this was our starting point. So we soon started playing around with different compounds. And in fact, you can move to larger organic cations for mamadinium and um, mix lead and iodide to get quite a good, a slightly lower band gap um, solar absorber material. And in fact, you can also mix a whole host of these ions together to tune the properties, to tune the band gap, and um, sort of to try to optimize it for solar energy con conversion in different configurations. So what, what's emerged is that these, um, oh no, can, my, my PowerPoint is trying to recover. <laughs> This is the problem of live. If it can, uh, can you still hear me? Okay, 
Yes. No? So th there's a risk my PowerPoint seizes. I'm going to carry on until I, you know, until I can't. Um, the, the, what, what soon emerged was that we could make very thin films of this material and it worked very well as a solar cell. And in fact, one of the main breakthroughs in 2012 that we made was realizing that you could use this material as an absorber layer in this sandwich structure just with PNN type charge extraction layers. And since then, the efficiency surged up to above 25% in single junction cells. Right, so I'm, I'm going to have to shut my PowerPoint, I'm afraid. So I'm just going to try see if I can stop sharing the screen. Sorry about this. Um, but it works nicely. I hear you. You can uh, see it. I can't change the slides. And I just had a notification saying that the PowerPoint was about to restart or had a problem. OK. So, uh, <laughs> On my uh, computer, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, Right, here we go. I'm going to just close PowerPoint. Sorry about this. Hopefully it'll be back on in a few seconds. <clears throat> okay, and then I will open PowerPoint again. My mouse has returned to being functional. This is the advantage with solar cells. They are more reliable than PowerPoint. <laughs> right. Let's hope I saved it. Oh, no, that's yours. <laughs> Just, oh, here, mine's come here. Right. Let's, let's go. Let's see if this is working. Should be right. OK. So, so the next aspect. So efficiency looks pretty good. Um, sorry, I realize I'm not starting to share again. I'll just start yep. talking. <clears throat> Here we go. Here it is. You can see it again? Yeah. And if I go full screen, are we there? Yep, perfect. Perfect, okay. So efficiency is pretty good. And of course, a key challenge has been making these materials stable. As we know, a photovoltaic module, a solar module needs to last for 25 years. And some of the starting materials, for instance, methylonium lead triiodide, if you put it under light at a slightly elevated temperature, and especially if they were subject to humidity as well, they decompose quite quickly into lead iodide. Part of this was decomposition of the perovskite absorber. So on the right, I show a schematic of a solar cell. All these different colored lines are different materials that are required to get efficient solar cell operation. So part of it is this material in the middle, the perovskite absorber. The other thing we have to worry about is reactivity and reactions with the contact layers. We have halides in these materials. Now halides are known to cause problems in electronic devices and it's because if they migrate into different materials, they can either do chemistry on those materials or change their electronic nature. So we have to have contact materials that are also insensitive to having halides diffuse into them or diffuse out of them. So with all that, there's been a whole host of work done on both improving the perovskite composition and finding the right materials to interface for efficient charge extraction and also trying to, with, with the key requirement to have high stability. So now the stability, one, one of the key things we've discovered in this whole process is there is um, the photochemical degradation can occur in these materials. So this is beyond humidity, but it's certainly accelerated by heat. And of course, the lead, the silver iodide, the sort of archetypical metal halide, if you like, the whole process of the photo photography process is to turn silver ions into metallic silver. And in doing so, the halide's lost. And that can happen in these perovskite materials. This is an electron microscopy image showing black holes after aging under light and temperature in air of these films. So we've been working out ways to slow down this process. And it's, it's really about understanding the defect chemistry, or at least we think it's about understanding the defect chemistry and, and tuning the system in such a way that we can switch off this, in essence, the photographic effect that happens in these materials or can happen in these materials. Um, now, if we come back to efficiency, um, we are just about matching single junction silicon with perovskites, but of course, 
silicon has a, a large industrial process that's been going on for the last you know many decades and being able to target competing with a existing technology with something new that only matches it is a big a hard sell so the question is can we do something better to extract more power or increase the efficiency beyond single junction silicon and of course to do that we have to look at the properties of light and how we can extract more energy from the solar spectrum we know that the the blue and ultraviolet photons carry a lot more energy than the red photons and again they carry a lot more ready energy than the infrared photons and the concept of multi-junction cells or tandem cells is not new but the notion is that we absorb some of the higher energy photons in one solar cell allowing the lower energy photons to pass through and in that solar cell we generate a very high voltage so the power which is current times voltage is high and there's much fewer many fewer thermalization losses and if we stack multiple junctions on top of each other and manage that we don't introduce new losses in that process then actually you can increase the conversion efficiency considerably so for instance the limit for a single junction cell might be something like 30 to 30 32 percent depending on the exact material in a tandem cell that increases up to 45 percent and in a triple junction cell up to 50 percent now as i said this isn't new and in fact there's some the world record solar cells are made of three five materials in multi-junction stacks this is a recently published example of a six junction solar cell using such materials and these are the sort of spectral responses so this shows the feasibility of making multi-junction cells with efficiencies approaching 40 percent now the question is can we do that effectively with perovskites or by combining perovskites with other technologies and of course um, the the obvious a material to partner with is silicon and if we can put a perovskite cell on top of a silicon cell we should be we will be able to generate a lot more voltage from the from the photons that are absorbed in the perovskite top cell and we can allow the infrared photons to pass through the silicon and um and generate power there another beauty of this approach of combining perovskites with silicon is that the tandem cell this is actually a photograph of a six inch wafer tandem cell perovskite on silicon the tandem cell just looks just like a normal silicon cell so it's an actual way of capitalizing upon all the advancements with modulization and deployment that have occurred in the silicon industry but delivering something that's generating a lot more power so again in the in the sort of theme of light um, absorbing sunlight is part of the process but in order to absorb sunlight and especially in one of these more complex multi-junction devices we have to worry about transmitting light into the right layers minimizing reflectance losses that we don't want and maximizing the absorption or matching the absorption in the different layers and this is just an example of having to worry about for instance going from one material which could be the perovskite top cell into another material with a different refractive index and having to tune for instance a, an anti-reflective layer in between and if it's in the middle of a solar cell it's also got to be electronically active this is an example of some work we did in collaboration with Helmholtz Center Berlin um, where we introduced a silicon silicon oxide interlayer and you can tune the refractive index of silicon silicon oxide by changing the fraction of silicon to silicon oxide and to tune it to the the ideal position for minimizing reflection losses in the infrared between the perovskite layer and the silicon layer and this led to reasonably good efficiency solar cells and importantly this is a spectral response very good spectral response in the infrared and this is off flat silicon so if you just took a silicon wafer and exposed it to air had no layers on top you'd have about 30 percent reflectance 30 to 40 percent reflectance loss off this region but the solar cell here which we show you the stack on the left this is all these layers are serving an electronic function but they also have to be designed to maximize the transmission of light into the total solar cell stack and then try to match so we get exactly the same light absorbed in the top perovskite layer as the silicon layer to match um, maximize the efficiency um, since that time there's been considerable progress further and the record efficiency now for the perovskite on silicon tandems at 29.1 percent and actually this is this is matching single junction gallium arsenide and it's still 
not too far off the best two junction cells from the um, three five semiconductors. So I'm sure over time with effort and, um, and, and with concerted effort, we will be able to match these 29, 32, 33% efficiencies from the three fives with this approach. So if we want to go beyond that, so beyond the 32, 33% efficiency, what do we do? Well, I'm afraid I'm not gonna reveal a new concept here. It's just go to three junctions. Um, at some point we might be able to come up with something new, but the, the, the next step forward to get up towards 40% efficiency is to go to triple junctions. And this is an example of all perovskite triple junction um, device that we did from our laboratory. And this is an example actually from um, Christoph Balif's labs where they've done two perovskite junctions on silicon and nicely conformally coated the silicon pyramids. Um, the, the last few things I want to talk about is how do we go from lab to fab? In the laboratory, we use methods like spin coating. We waste a lot of solvent. We don't worry about whether the, the solvents we're using are, are suitable for large volume manufacturing, et cetera. And we want to turn this in a short time into something that can be produced in a, in a photovoltaics factory. Now, there's a number of companies working in this. Of course, I've got um, uh, intimate um, knowledge of Oxford PV with it being a spin out from our company, our, our university, but there's a number of different companies working in this, uh, other early stage companies trying to target different approaches, some targeting lightweight, flexible PV for buildings and automotives, other looking to try to power drones. And um, um, there's also large scale industry looking at trying to work on these things. So it is happening. Of course, everyone has to solve the challenges that are present, and we're, we're presently at Oxford PV, we're moving into volume manufacturing. So this is a facility in Germany, in Brandenburg, that we purchased in 2016. And um, we're now putting in the equipment for the first 100 megawatt production line um, that should be in production towards the end of 2021. So these are, these are perovskite silicon cells and modules, and we're working towards making a commercial launch towards the end of next year. So with that, I will thank you very much and, um, and also just acknowledge all the collaborators in my research group and who have um, partaken in this work. Thank you. So I've finished now, I can't hear you, Joachim. Shall I Microphone was switched off. <laughs> okay. So nice. Henry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a technology. <laughs> Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Yeah, we, and we are enthusiastically looking for the end of next year. Uh, we can see 100 megawatts on the market. Congratulations. <laughs> not quite on the market, but starting to come off the. <laughs> no, yeah, we will not uh, produce them to put them on stock. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you will give them at least away. away. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, once again, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? I see one. Uh, yeah, this is just very interesting. Thanks a lot. Uh, if there is no question, I have one. Um, if you stack uh, perovskites on silicon, uh, which kind of silicon or which kind of uh, uh, silicon so, uh, cell structure would you use? There are so many yeah. from Topcon and Perk and so heterojunctions and I know there is a strong discussion and I would li like to learn what you prefer. Okay, so a, from, yeah. From, from, what you will use in your production. <laughs> well, from my perspective, in principle, the perovskite cell can match with any silicon cell. If you one thing that has to be managed is the texture of the silicon cell. So if you, if you saw on that photo I showed of the triple junction cells, the perovskite layers are very, very thin and the texture of silicon can be very, very large. But that, that challenge is, the, so the processing methodology has to be able to cope with texture. But in terms of the actual technology, I certainly we, we are using in the Oxford PV line, it's gonna be first manufactured on a heterojunction cell. And the, the rationale behind that is that the heterojunction cells 
do, do deliver the highest efficiency at present. And the first perovskite on silicon tandems will definitely be pushing um, for the highest end market of the, um, the, to deliver the highest performance possible. Now for larger volume, it could make sense to use the perk cell. And of, of course, um, what we know is that we only get half the power or at least we only generate half, you know, absorb half the light in the silicon cell. So in fact, two thirds of the power comes from the perovskite cell. So a 1% difference in efficiency of the single junction would only translate to half a percent difference on the tandem cell of we're talking about the silicon junction. So there for absolute lowest cost, it may make sense to use PERC technology, but that, that really remains to be seen. Our priority is to deliver a, a functional technology that will last the duration required and, um, and deliver it at the highest power per cell and at highest yield, obviously, in manufacturing as well. And for that, we've chosen the heterojunction technology. Okay, thank you very much. There are two other questions. I can bundle them. Uh, one is asking for the reliability and the other one for PV toxicity. Uh, Yep. Sure. Okay, so, so reliability, we're doing everything humanly possible to make sure this technology will last for the 25 years required for mainstream PV. And we have we've full confidence that we're on track to deliver that. Um, it's been about sorting out material instabilities and, and instabilities at interfaces and in the entire device. As far as toxici toxicity goes, we've done a number with collaborators, we've done a number of environmental um, life cycle analyses, etc. And actually the environmental impact of lead specifically is minor, extremely minor compared to some of the other components in the solar cell. So in uh, such as, you know, the silicon wafer itself, the amount of energy that's required means a lot of electricity is used and that produces a lot more um, environmental ecotoxicity than the lead by, by orders of magnitude and, and likewise indium if we do use indium in ITO. So the, the, the re reality of environmental impact from the presence of lead or toxicity is very low. Of course, in manufacturing, it has to be handled. So there's no exposure to workforce and people running the production line. Okay, Henry, thanks again very much. Excellent Thank you. Talk. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to Natalal for the next presentation.